Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it happens to be. Welcome back to another Ask an Expert session. My name is Ryan, I'm part of the IKEA Foundation communications team. Thrilled to have you here. And welcome to our first Ask an Expert session from our live studio here in the Netherlands. This is really cool. It's nice to, it's nice to be able to, to touch you. That's, that's, that's really, really weird. Although we are respecting the one and a half meter distance, so not to worry, we're, uh, we're being safe there. But uh, I'm joined here today with Elton. Elton is a program manager as part of our agriculture livelihoods portfolio. Elton, how are you doing today? Welcome, thanks for being here. Thanks for the intro, Ryan. Hello to everyone and welcome to this IKEA Foundation Ask the Expert session. Thank you for joining us. My name is Elton Mujigajivi and I'm a program manager at the IKEA Foundation. At the IKEA Foundation, we work to create a better everyday life for the many people. I'm part of the Agricultural Livelihoods team and our goal is to support a transition, a transition to an agri-food system that saves both people and the planet. We now know that our current food systems are stretching planetary boundaries beyond their limits by valuing quantity over quality and driving farmers to produce monocrops for low prices. We are using up natural resources in the process which are needed for sustained production. And in the process, we are degrading the land, leading to climate change and extreme weather events. In this, smallholder farmers pay the highest price and are the most vulnerable. Agent change is required to make our food systems regenerative, secular, and inclusive. Approaches like agroecology can restore our ecosystems, regenerate biodiversity and soils, and also contribute to rolling back climate change while providing us with healthier food and resilient livelihoods for the many. So, in 2019, IKEA Foundation started a partnership with Agroecology Fund, a global multi-donor fund to support grassroots groups of farmers, researchers, and indigenous peoples that promote agroecology. These groups are testing agroecological models, gathering compelling evidence, and using these to persuade others to change course. The Food Rights Alliance is one of Agroecology Fund's grantees. It is a coalition of civil society organizations that are promoting agroecology for a sustainable food system in Uganda. Today, I will be talking with our partner, Agroecology Fund and Food Rights Alliance from Uganda. I'm joined by Daniel Moss, who is the executive director of the Agroecology Fund. Hi, Daniel. Hey, good evening. I'm also joined by Agnes Kirabo, who is executive director of Food Rights Alliance. Hi, Agnes. Hey, Elton. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks. Uh, so let's get into business. Um, I want to start with you, Daniel. You have led the Agroecology Fund from its inception. Could you tell us what tell us what inspired the formation of the Agroecology Fund? What was the need that you saw that you wanted to address? Sure. Thanks so much, Elton, and thanks so much for laying out some of the, the genesis of some of the pro problems that we face and the reason that we are coming together to transform our food systems to something more sustainable for people and planet. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Well, you know, I think that you, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I mean, there are so many interrelated problems that come from the way that we've been growing food over the last 150 years or so. Um, problems that you mentioned about um, biodiversity, about climate change, about just, you know, planetary boundaries um, and the livelihoods of, this, of small farmers. Well, I th what happened about in 2012 is that a group of donors, a uh, combination of uh, U.S. foundations and European foundations, uh, were looking out at the landscaping, at the landscape and uh, perceiving a growing movement of kind of across sectors, from the health sector, from the nutrition sector, from the uh, anti-poverty sector, 
from the climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation sector that were saying, well, you know, the food system is 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 terribly important. Obviously, it feeds the planet, but it's not only uh, so important for humanity, it's also so important because it has so much bearing on the way that we treat the earth, that we treat our waterways. Um, what's happening out there? And, and what they saw was this kind of emerging movement of uh, organizations, networks coming together to try to solve uh, the food crisis and try to solve it in such a way that it was respectful of our planetary boundaries. So the donors came together and said, well, could we could we form a pooled fund? Could we put our resources together in a way that was really what I call intersectional? So that you know, there's there's we're paying attention to science, we're paying attention to organizational development, we're paying attention to building democratic civil society movements that can work with their governments, work with their farmers and scientists and other constituencies to find solutions. Um, and so four donors came together, they pooled some funds and we began to make grants across the world to support the emergence of this um, agroecology movement in the different forms. I mean, so there's movements in India, there's movements in Africa, there's movements in Latin America. And we sought to be a, a diverse global fund to support these expressions of ways that people were coming together to improve their food systems. Well, it was a, it was a, a good bet, um, like anything like a startup, you don't really know what's gonna happen but the donors came together as four in 2012, and now there are um, 33 donors um, from many continents of the earth that have come together to pool their resources. And the, the purpose of course, is that at the end of the day, we wanna resource organizations, grassroots organizations, like the one Agnes is gonna speak about in Uganda. But we also wanna provide a learning vehicle for the donors to understand the problem better. And for our, in our case, we have a very interesting, which uh, multi-stakeholder governance process which includes donors, advisors, and grantees together, learning about the, the challenges that they face in advancing agroecology and coming up with solutions together. So we believe very strongly in this collaborative network uh, where we can teach and learn from one another, share experiences. And so over the time, we've amassed more resources to support agroecology. And increasingly, we've cooperated with governments and uh, development agencies um, from all over the world because we see a growing movement towards supporting, resourcing this important kind of very exciting, very dynamic global movement towards rethinking our food systems. Wow. You mentioned uh, that this coming together of various funders together to support agroecology. We know agroecology has been around for some time, for many years actually. And could you, to help us to understand more, could you explain a bit more about what agroecology is and why is it now capturing the global interest uh, across the world? Sure, thanks Elton. Um, well, let, let's just say, maybe just start for a little quick second on the, the word agroecology, which might be a, a bit foreign to some of the, the folks here today. Um, so, you know, agroecology has two parts to the, to the term agro and ecology, agro referring to agriculture, food production, and ecology referring to ecosystems and, and the, the rhythms and the systems of nature. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, how did this happen? What, what, it seems kind of obvious in some ways, right? I mean, we farm on land, we use water, we use air, we use micronutrients in the soil. Why do you even need to think about agroecology? Shouldn't all um, agriculture really be based on working with nature? Well, in short, probably the best way to think about agroecology is farming with nature. And then, um, you know, farming has been around for 12,000 years, more or less, since human beings started domesticating seeds and, and, and settling and, and growing crops. Um, and we pretty much, you know, for, for uh, the, the vast majority of, of the last 12,000 years, we, we have been farming with nature. Um, and then, you know, as societies uh, experimented with technologies, as all of the, you know, kind of the, the tools became available to us, um, we got excited about kind of, mm, I guess I'd have to say sort of controlling nature. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. I was just in the, um, the uh, hardware store the other day with my son, and we were looking at the, uh, the gardening section. And there was a row after row of um, pesticides and, and, and fertilizers and um, in, in insecticides and herbicides. And really, you had a very hard time. What, what you saw in looking at those rows was this kind of like kind of a, a war on nature. Um, so that the idea of growing food now is more the idea of we'll remove nature from the, the, the field, you know, 
you take everything away and then purchase seeds, purchase fertilizers, purchase pesticides, and really develop this, what we call a high input model of agriculture, where you're becoming dependent on external inputs for the way you grow food. And th this, it's kind of a war in some ways, and that kind of war on nature in order to grow our food supply has created a lot of casualties. So agroecology has become interesting to many because, you know, we, as we began this discussion, Elton, you showed some of the limits of what we're facing and the way we're growing food, extending beyond our, our planetary boundaries. Um, and there's a lot of casualties. There's a lot of casualties in that war. There's, there's 700 million hungry people. There's 2 billion people that are malnourished or lack all the nutrients they need to some degree or the other. Studies find that um, the food system is responsible for about a third of our global emissions, so really contributing to climate change as we manufacture more and more pesticides with fossil fuels and, and fertilizers, and we apply them to our fields. Um, there's a big problem with soil degradation, loss of soil, which of course we do that at our peril since soil is kind of the basis of our ability to, to sustain ourselves and feed ourselves. And there's been an alarming trend of loss of family farms. And we know that the vast majority of the world, especially in the developing world, still maintains smallholder agriculture, which provides massive employment and massive food security to communities. And over the course of years, there's been a diminishing number of family farms and a growing concentration of land in fewer hands, providing less employment, which ultimately means families breaking up as children go looking for jobs in their countries, in their cities or overseas, um, many, many of the problems that derive from out-migration. And I think importantly, it's worth mentioning that the interest in agroecology comes from the health sector. Um, there has been, many people might know that we depend on you know, fewer and fewer foods for our basic nutrition, that our, our calories are derived from corn and soy and sugar and wheat. I and mean, previously, we used to eat a, a vast variety of foods that provided all manner of micronutrients to our bodies that we need. And perhaps more than ever with the pandemic, people are thinking about, wow, what do I need to keep myself healthy? And our body really needs all of those foods that come from the variety, the diversity of food. So I think that we, we, we have this cheap, this food system that's provided cheap food, um, but we see some of the casualties of it. So there's been uh, increasing interest in agroecology, a way to grow food that's in sync with nature, that respects our bodies and respects the planet. Wow, it, it sounds like a kind of a renaissance of uh, agroecology, albeit one that is triggered by the crisis that we are facing right now. Let me come to you, Agnes. Uh, and I want to pose the same question uh, to you, but a little different. <laughs> Why does Food Rights Alliance believe in agroecology? Uh, thank you, Alton. Uh, to start with, uh, Food Rights Alliance is a coalition of organizations and individuals in Uganda driven by a vision of a world free from hunger and malnutrition. Our broad agenda is feeding people on safe, and sustainable food. So it's about the quality and the quantity, but also the safety of the food that is feeding the generation today and the generation to come. Uh, one of our major programs, mega programs, is sustainable farming systems. And this farming, the sustainable farming systems looks at how do we ensure that the farmers, the family farmers that uh, Daniel has talked about one, occupy their space, given the role that they play. Uh, they occupy their space in controlling the production resources, including land, soil, water, to feed themselves, to feed the world, to feed us, those of us who are operating in the urban areas, as they feed nature. I think that is very, very important. It is not about feeding humanity, but it is also feeding, uh, feeding nature. We take agroecology as one of the greatest opportunities that the world should not miss because of its ability to feed the people, but also to feed nature, which is very, very important. And you know, that uh, cross interaction between the people and the nature that feeds them and not necessarily managing an extractive kind of production system like we are the last generation to live here. Our programs uh, in Uganda stem from the grassroots, 
and the grassroots, this is where we are working with the family farmers in their own ecosystems. One, to reappreciate what they were traditionally doing, to give themselves courage to, 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 to support each other and to rebuild the trust that actually what they were doing and what they continue to do is actually what the world should follow. And therefore they have an opportunity to shape decision and also shape the new world order or the country order. So organizing that voice in practice and ensure that these family farmers with confidence in their own ecosystems believe in what they are doing and they come out to share in the different spaces, including shaping municipal, uh, municipal policies and laws. And then our other sphere of work is at the national level where we are actually advocates to inform policy and law uh, to ensure that policy and law creates an enabling environment for such neglected but wonderful methodologies of feeding people to find space and be guaranteed by policy and law. Uh, we are very, very, very particular on issues of practice, but also on issues of law, because law determines who eats and who doesn't eat. Uh, policy determines how food is going to be produced in a given country or even in the entire world. So for us at FRA, we regard law and policy as one great intervention that we must engage in to be able to support the practices that the smallholder family farmers have already adopted of agroecology and then to counter the forces and using, using law. Wow. That's really impressive. Uh, what I get is, yeah, this is about uh, building resilience and empowering families to be able to feed themselves and being able to influence policies that support their farming. Uh, let me uh, move, uh, move a bit to Daniel, uh, because I understand you, you operate globally, and Agnes has given us what it means for family farmers on the ground. But I want to hear from you, uh, uh, Daniel, at, from a high level, if you can share to, with us some promising changes that you have, which give you hope that you have um, seen and, and that give you hope that your dream of bringing about a sustainable food system is taking shape from a global overview. Mm. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, just uh, to, to build on Agnes's point, um, just this morning I came across my email, uh, a, a news bulletin about Sri Lanka, where we have pro uh, partners, uh, grassroots partners that are working on farmer training and agroecology. And there I just read that the Sri Lankan government has decided to prohibit the importation of um, chemical fertilizers and pesticides and rather use the kind of public subsidy money towards supporting the fabrication of organic uh, fertilizers in the country, which we think is a great news because there's so much uh, local uh, uh, biomass that can be used to produce effective fertilizers without causing so much dead and so much difficulty on the uh, on, on the environment from over fertilization of chemicals. So just to say that, you know, it started out as this very practical program around farmer training in Sri Lanka and has moved into building the voice and the influence of the farmers towards being able to work with government officials towards a very important piece of policy. Um, just to take a quick view of other places we work, we have a partner in Kyrgyzstan, <clears throat> had the opportunity to visit there not too long ago. Um, and it, it's a network of women that are doing seed saving. So they're, pro they're, they're collecting local seeds, tomatoes, cabbage, uh, lo local varieties. And those seeds are forming the basis of supporting the women in the network to, to, to create their own uh, household gardens, but also community gardens and also build a food supply that is then uh, used to support the school feeding program that is a, a policy of the Kyrgyzstan government. Um, 
so that's that's really exciting to see the ways that they started out you know as a network of women and then they were able to feed into this important piece of a safety net in Kyrgyzstan which is to feed the school children similarly in Africa we work with a, a network called Rescope um, which has an, a program also focused on school feeding so there they're using the schools as kind of a locus of community farms as a training parents um, and they also have a school feeding program which is based on purchasing healthy agroecologically produced food from the farming families in the region uh, to again feed the, the, the students. So that kind of integration and, and using the power of government purchasing to support healthy farming um, is really exciting. Uh, just to say in, the, in Africa, we work with a network, a really a broad network that covers 50 countries, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. And they are working with uh, 10 governments in Africa to insert um, agroecology as a pillar of their climate change plan. So as you know, you know, countries across the world uh, are creating these climate action plans to get in line with uh, em emissions requirements. Um, and what they're saying is that the, the, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa is working with their governments on looking at that landscape uh, management. You know, how would we do our landscape? How can we conserve more how can we uh, sequester more carbon, for example, in healthy soils? So working on these kind of, not just on the emissions part, which of course is critically important, but also looking at that kind of sequestration. How do we store store carbon? And in order to do so, how do we protect our vegetation? How do we protect our soils? So those are just a few examples. Well, this all sounds very interesting at a high level. To make it easier for and to picture for our audience, could you share some concrete examples in more details of how your how, how your grantees are benefiting and, and also learning and spreading the approach of agroecology. Sure, um, I, I might if I if I may I might just choose an example from India, uh, a place that we've been working extensively over the years, and we actually had the opportunity uh, most recently, just before the pandemic, to gather all of our grantees, our donors, advisors, um, in southern India, in. Uh, Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh to study something called the Zero Budget Natural Farming Program, which is a program um, uh, that has been adopted by the state government of Andhra Pradesh to um, spread natural farming um, in that state. And the, the, the term is a little bit funny, so let me just say that for a second, this term zero budget natural farming, it took me a little while to understand. And the zero budget refers to the fact that Farmers uh, in India and across the world have become highly indebted. Uh, as I mentioned earlier about having to rely on purchased inputs, um, there's a lot of farmer debt as they purchase more pesticides and fertilizers and, and uh, fabricated uh, seeds. Um, and what you were seeing in India was a lot of problems with family poverty as a result of this indebtedness. In fact, in India, tragically, uh, they say there's been about 300,000 farmer suicides over the past two decades or so. Um, so really a grave, grave crisis. So the, 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 what, what they did was so there was a lot of experimentation with farming techniques um, using local, uh, local inputs for um, soil improvement and specifically soil improvement and also for soil um, moisture retention. It's a, uh, Andhra Pradesh is very much of a drought uh, prone area. And so the question was, how could you grow food year round in an area that receives so little rainfall? Um, so they were able to uh, identify this combination of uh, uh, vegetative mass and also uh, using uh, feces and urine from animals, from, from cows, um, to improve the soil quality um, and to enable being able to produce a variety of crops uh, year round. So that's been a really exciting thing. And one of the interesting things about that process of zero budget natural farming is that it was really built on the work over the years of women's, what they call women's self-help organizations. So these are village women that were having saving clubs and meeting with one another, trying to solve their, their family economies, family problems. And they're really the backbone of the problem. So you have a backbone of the solution in the sense that they're the ones doing the experimentation, doing the adaptation, and then they become trainers, they become promoters, where they're working with their neighbors to promote this model. So it's kind of this very organic way of, 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 of building out, what they call scaling up agroecology, built on the, um, the positive work of these women and, the, and the, the presence of these women's organizations over the years. And interestingly, it's been such a successful program, and it really is one of the kind of flagship programs globally about how we can really make this transition because it's, it's very complicated. You know, there's a lot of farmers that are, you know, very deep into debt and they're very deep into the 
practices that we've been adopted over the past 150 years? How do you help them transition towards more natural farming? Well, you know, Andhra Pradesh is doing that through this kind of combination of the strength of the women's movement and at the same time, the commitment of the state government. And we've, uh, since the learning exchange that we held in India uh, last year, there have been contacts between uh, the Andhra Pradesh government and the Mexican government, uh, the Kenyan and Rwandan governments. So this kind of exchange also, even at the policy level amongst ministries of agriculture, where these policies uh, get created, uh, where public monies are allocated for subsidies, that kind of thing, that's you know, very important in the uh, amplification of these practices. Um, so we're, we're really, the Agroecology Fund is deeply committed to that kind of uh, exchange learning because we think that there's, that we, we find so many great examples of the kind that I mentioned and the terrible importance of providing a platform where they can be shared and people can be motivated um, to experiment. Um, so I think that that's, uh, you know, what I, would, what I would like to say about that. The only thing to add about that is that then the question is how to take this to a global level. Um, and we uh, find that there's a lot of very interesting, important movement inside the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. So within the United Nations, there exists this body called the Food and Agriculture Organization, where they deliberate on food and farm policy. I mean, agroecology is really rising in prominence uh, in that body. Countries are really looking at uh, the recommendations of the UN with respect to agroecology, and it is recommended as a key pillar of agricultural development. And they're looking to their neighbor countries for clues about how to make that work in their countries. So we're very, very buoyed. We're very excited to see this really gaining uh, traction at the level of the United Nations. Wow, a very nice example there, uh, Daniel. Uh, indeed showing how Agroecology Fund is supporting the grassroots in really trying out agroecological approaches, uh, especially the, this case of uh, zero budget natural farming, and I mean, to show that it can feed us and restore our land. That case is quite, for me, is, is quite inspiring and it demonstrates also the role of women in driving this process and how empowered grassroots, stronger networks can really influence the policies at the highest level. But the challenges in our food systems and our the climate issues are really complex. They require not one but many actors and also new ways of collaborating. And so looking at what is happening closer to the ground? I want to come to you, Agnes. Could you explain to us how you are assisting farmers to organize themselves, engage with each other and promote agroecology, but also get a stronger voice that they can use to try and influence policies? Thank you. Uh, the first attempt to advance the agroecology agenda in Uganda was much focused. We first focused on the farmers, trying to help the farmers uh, see how they change their production systems. And then we realized that we aren't making a lot of headways because already uh, farmers are already, you know, they are dubbed with negative negativity. The smallholder farmers, the way they do their agriculture, and which is always very much condemned. So we adopted a collaborative multi-sectoral approach because we realized that we could not promote agroecology in isolation. So we adopted that macro, uh, multi-sectoral approach. Uh, you know, one, continue working with farmers, with the smallholder farmers, to really uh, get convinced and continue practicing, organizing their own seeds, managing their land and water systems sustainably, uh, you know, all of those good practices of agroecology. And then we moved out to say, where are the consumers? Where are the people that wish to eat this premium food from this production system? How do we get the consumer movements adopt this agenda? And they advance it in their own spaces. And that one, we succeeded doing that. We turned the aside and said that agro-food, agroecology, agroecologically produced food should find its way on the market. It should be accessed and somebody should pay for to reward the farmers that are engaged in this production system. But where are the trade debates at bilateral and multilateral level? They are opposite to what we are advancing. So we stretched out to trade organizations such that they adopt the agroecology agenda 
and advance it in their own multilateral and bilateral trade negotiations and spaces. We say that is not enough. We moved out to look for the policy makers, you know, engaging the parliamentary committees and the parliamentary forums on food and nutrition, the parliamentary committees on agriculture, the parliamentary committees on health, and also the committee on natural resources. You know, broadening our net based on the purpose. And the reason was, how do we make sure that it is not the silent voice of the few of us, but it is a collective voice being advanced almost in all the spaces where conversations on food systems are taking place. And we, we realized that this has really, really worked uh, for us in terms of uh, relationships. And we have learned quite so many things that, uh, you know, if we don't keep opening up and, and, and trading our agenda and trading our, uh, our, our agroecology into other spaces, then our agenda will get started and then it stops being advanced and moving. So that one, we learned it and we continue to recruit as many people as possible, as many actors as possible. We are spreading gospel according to agroecology in various spaces and once people get converted we let the fire continue continue going uh the other thing we have learned is also is that uh, uh the recruitment process for this agenda is a continuous process and the building of capacity is a because people move on and uh, agendas keep um emerging globally but also locally that people keep diverting, maybe they joined the agenda for also other purposes in addition. The lesson is we have to continuously recruit um, uh, um, apostles, people who are going to continue banging this message out there. Otherwise, big corporates that are not going to work because Together. Uh, if you want to go first, I mean, go alone, but if you want to go far, let's go together. That's an important message that I pick from all the various actors that Agnes is and, and her organization are engaging in order to bring to fore. Now, let me move to, uh, yeah, to what is current here. I mean, today, of course, we are confronted with uh, the effects of uh, COVID-19. And to come to you, Daniel, uh, we seem to have lost, we have lost uh, Agnes there. So to come to you, Daniel, how have you seen COVID-19 impacting food systems in the region that you support? And in that, could you briefly also, in a broad sense, uh, share with us what Agroecology Fund has, has really has done in this process? Sure, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, obviously, the, 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 there's so many aspects of the the, the pandemic, the, the the health crisis that we're facing that have had a um, you know caused problems in the food system and have exacerbated um, existing problems. So, you know, some of what we've seen that we've all seen as as, as consumers is is the question about the availability of food. Um, I know where I live. The supermarkets stayed open, but the uh, farmers markets, the, the kind of plazas where you might go and be able to purchase food from uh, local producers, vegetables, fruits, et cetera, those tended to be shut down. Um, so I, I think one of what we saw is that the access to market for the what, for the for, for the small scale local agroecological producers was made more difficult while the supermarkets remained open, which of course that's critically important for families to access. But I think it does talk, talk, speak to this issue about the, um, maybe the, uh, sort of the bias of our food systems towards a long supply chains of imported foods. I know when I go to the supermarket, there's so much of what is eaten there. 
um, that comes from overseas, and I think that's characteristic everywhere, even in, in uh, uh, you know, a, a, across developing countries. So I think one of the challenges that we saw is, is working with farmer organizations um, that were seeking to protect the, continue to keep open um, marketing places that could offer healthy food to healthy foods to consumers. Um, and, you know, supermarkets are just one source of food. And in fact, most of the people in the world still get their food from traditional markets. So critically important to safeguard that. What we did in the Agroecology Fund is that we quickly um, uh, created an emergency COVID fund to help communities um, offer food security solutions to their constituencies, to their farmer constituencies, to their consumer constituencies. At the end of the day, what that meant is that we work with a lot of um, farmer networks, uh, for example, in Manila, Philippines, in uh, Harare, Zimbabwe, um, in Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina, that were working with producers outside of urban areas that were seeking to get their produce into uh, urban areas. And this became a really important part of the solution to getting healthy food to people during the pandemic. Um, we saw the ways that these farmer organizations were able to cooperate with municipal governments, for example, to find openings for um, traditional markets to make the food available. In some cases, we saw a tremendous amount of, um, of uh, innovation with digital um, uh, sourcing and digital delivery. Um, so some of these farm organizations, even though they weren't able to set up as they might have in a, in a kind of an open air plaza, they were working on um, delivery systems of healthy food to families um, set up through WhatsApp and other online mechanisms. So we really saw a lot of uh, creativity and innovation in the ways that um, to help producers continue to, uh, to grow but importantly, to continue to make that link to consumers and to provide them with the food that they needed that would really, you know, fortify their their bodies during this critical time. Oh, great to hear that you were able to respond and, and happy that we now have Agnes back. Uh, and I want to pose the same question to you, Agnes. You are on the ground. You work with farmers, workers, uh, and many others, and you are dealing with the effects of COVID-19. Especially, I'm curious to hear about the Food Haven platform that you started. Could you mm -hmm. briefly uh, let us in on that? Uh, thank you, and I'm sorry uh, the digital divide had its own impacts on me as well. Um, but uh, I want to pick it from where Daniel has put it. There were restrictions in movements and uh, restrictions in the operations of businesses, uh, but our immediate uh, response as the alliance and our stakeholders is to make, to make sure was to make sure that uh, safe and nutritious food uh, found its way into this the standard operating procedures and the common messages that governments and other stakeholders that had an opportunity to speak put out there we made sure that uh, this is an aspect that actually runs ahead of the clinical options uh in in response to covid 19. it wasn't easy but we succeeded in doing that and after creating that we are happy uh that uh, we th there are the stakeholders out there like the agroecology fund that we are thinking the same way we are thinking and they were willing to support our initiatives because now we had created demand for the food and the farmers continued the production because the farms were not restricted except the industrial farms where they exist. But the smallholder farmers were never um, uh, restricted uh, during the lockdowns. So there are these farmers that had really invested and they had the foods and there are these consumers that were locked up in their houses and they needed the foods but they could not access them. And this is how we innovated the Food Haven, an initiative that we are still uh, building to make sure that one, digital technology does not leave agroecology behind. So for those that thought that agroecology is an out-fashioned out traditional practice happening their own farm, the Food Haven gave us an opportunity to promote it that even it, uh, uh, technology as it advances, yeah, agroecology has space in there. And in the food haven, it is about 
uh, we organizing, we worked on organizing the farmers that are producing in this eco ecological safe system and be able to tell the consumers out there that they have the foods. So the consumers also order for the foods and the food haven is working as a blocker between the two. As, uh, as the consciousness of the people uh, continue to grow for eating safe and nutritious foods, I think the food haven still needs a lot of support and the food havens in the world there still need a lot of support to bridge this gap between the producers and the consumers because one, we have learned that actually the people are willing to pay for these foods. But when after promoting them, they ask us, where can we find the foods? And the people who are willing to pay and reward the farmers such that the farmers get motivated to produce more of these foods and, we claim, and the foods claim their share in the food chain uh, and need to be motivated by this market and uh, we still think that our heaven, although still in its infancy stages, it is something that we continue being committed to that still needs a lot of support because we do believe it is going to serve the purpose, getting agroecology from the history that people knew it to occupying the modern life of the people, of the consumers, and then it captures social economic and eventually the political spaces. Wow, that's some uh, impressive progress there, which indeed demonstrates that with strong, well-organized networks and support, it is possible to change the tide. Well, we know a lot about what needs to be changed, but to make that happen, it's an, happening at scale of the whole food system is a big challenge. What are the all the complex pieces that we need uh, in order to solve this puzzle? Well, we do not have all the answers and we can only find them if we pull our collective knowledge with our partners, uh, our shared vision, our values, and um, our shared values as well as with those we, we have shared goals. This is why uh, at the Care Foundation, we will be bringing together all our partners who are working on agriculture at the first ever learning event from the 17th to 20th of May, each of these days, starting at 2 p.m. to 4.30, to share ideas and experiences as well as best practices so that together we can identify and work on our common interests, challenges, and successes. Thank you both, um, Agnes and Daniel. Uh, I think we, we do have a few minutes to look at a few questions from the audience. Uh, I see a question here from Anders M. Hansen. He says, uh, hasn't artificial fertilizers supplied food for a large growing population and prevented hunger? And I want to pose uh, to you, Daniel, this question. So he is asking whether artificial fertilization has not been part of supplying, I mean, solved the food problem already. Yes, um, absolutely. So we have seen um, uh, extensive use of artificial fertilization, you know, for, for at least the last two centuries. Um, so, you know, as a, again, when you look at the, the arc of agriculture, uh, not for all of agriculture, but in the in the the, the more modern times. So yeah, the, the, and I I think there was another part, a related part of the question was, uh, can we feed the world then uh, by by uh, limiting um, artificial fertilization and using agroecology, which uses the assets locally in the local um, environment for soil mineralization, soil growth, soil health. Um, micronutrients, um, seed diversity that's obtained locally. Well, so I, you know, it, 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 it's important to recognize the important yield gains that we've gotten through chemical fertilization. And then the question is, can we get those similar yield gains through um, organic methods, agroecological methods? And there's certainly been many, many studies, peer-reviewed journal studies that have showed that, you know, uh, hectare for hectare, agroecology can be as productive as 
uh, you know, chemically based um, agriculture. Um, so I, th I think that there's, there's no question about that. The, the question is, how, how do you, um, how, how do you uh, support that kind of transition? So if we're going to start building a, a system that's not just based on ad, uh, artificial uh, fertilization, what can we do to build a supportive environment? I think that's exactly the kind of thing that Agnes has been talking about um, in this kind of multi-stakeholder uh, work together, you know, amongst consumers, among scientists, among farmers to transform the food system. So part of the answer can, can, uh, can, can we feed the world with agroecology is can we set up a fair food system, not just look at the productive, the production values of chemical versus agroecology, but can we, can we set up the right environment with incentives, for example, in public policy around what I was mentioning before around uh, purchasing um, local varieties for school feeding programs? How do we set up all this constellation of cooperation between health systems, uh, uh, ministries of economy, et cetera, um, to create an enabling environment where this kind of agriculture can thrive. So the question, I, I think that the we know this is essential. Our, the, the way that we're growing our food now cannot go on. We're, we're, we're exceeding the limits of our, of our system. And uh, there's a lot of people still suffering poverty, um, malnutrition, uh, and hunger. So what can we do to do it better? And I think that we have terrific solutions when we come together um, as Elton mentioned, in these kind of learning exchanges where we can look at the problem from multiple sectors, health, nutrition, farming, and uh, environmental conservation, et cetera, and come up with solutions. So there's no question that, you know, right now chemical farming has the advantage because also they have amassed the, the attention of governments. There's a lot of public subsidies out there. There's a lot of private research and public research that goes into ways to manufacture new and better chemicals. The question is what would happen if we put that same attention into agroecological methods. And I, I think that the, the answer is pretty clear. The answer is pretty clear that agroecology could really thrive um, as the, the pillar of, um, of our food system if it got that kind of support. Thank you for that. And we, we could speak for the whole day uh, addressing all the questions that are still depending and uh, that are still there. But uh, yeah, unfortunately we need to wrap up. Uh, that's why that leaves me to thank you very much, Agnes and Daniel. A very interesting discussion on how Agroecology Fund and your grantees are working on what could be a solution to a sustainable food system and how grassroots organizations are testing models of agroecology. And lastly, uh, these unprecedented levels of collaboration uh, that are happening and also that will be required to address uh, challenges at scale. Well, that brings us to the end of our session today. Thank you all very much for listening in, and I hope that you are all as inspired as I am. Indeed, absolutely. Thank you so much, Elton. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Agnes. It was a pleasure to listen to you, and obviously we could have gone on for much longer. We had some great questions from the audience that we weren't able to get to. We'll see if we have a chance to answer those directly in the comments, so keep an eye on that. But uh, for now, just a really big thanks for your time. We really appreciate you joining us. To everyone who is able to join and, uh, and has contributed questions and, and uh, Join us for this really interesting session about such a critical topic. We appreciate you coming and, uh, and giving us your time. So I think with that, we'll just say a big, big thank you. Wave goodbye. And we'll see you next time on Ask an Expert and hopefully next week with the uh, Partner Learning Event. Very good. Thanks, thank everyone. You.